Karma Police Debt, who I assume works for the IRS, asks, Hi, in the Flower review, you said that games were overpriced. However, in the Mario review, you said that it wasn't overpriced despite being 350 megabytes burnt to a CD. So what's the truth? Looking forward to your next review. Ollie. Well, Ollie of the IRS, um, you know, I also said in the Mario review that it wasn't about size. And then when it came to, you know, is it overpriced or not, you could argue both sides. And that's a problem with this stuff. You know, there's n not necessarily a right or wrong answer, but I can tell you what I think. Um, outside of Mario, as with Mario, it was more, you know, okay this time, but if they do another 2D Mario... Look, I'd love it if they did a new 2D Mario for Wii every year. But, uh, you know, charge 15, 20 bucks for them after the first 50, I think. Or at least for the first one, they could have charged 29.99, but whatever. Like I said, first one in almost 20 years, so I'm willing to pay pretty much whatever for at least the first one. But going back to the flower review, which you cited here, look... I'm probably going to catch shit for this, but uh, the future games is way cheaper prices for a lot of different reasons. One of which being on live, which I'll address in a question about on live. Back when we were manufacturing cartridges and games had to go to a store with hours electricity, I went all over this in the flower review. It's different. With DLC, the cost structure has changed and they're still charging a lot of respects old school prices. Not entirely, you know, Steam's got a lot of cheap games, they have ridiculous sales on the weekends, you know. I think ultimately all games should be no more than $10. And I fucking mean that. You know, something like World of Warcraft could be like $10 with a $5 monthly subscription. But if they're delivering stuff mostly electronically to us, it does more than just cut down on your overhead. You see, again, in the flower review, I said it makes no sense that they're charging the prices they used to. And some people will say, well, you used to have de development teams of one or two people. And now you have development teams of, you know, 20 to 50 people. You know, games like, you know, Grand Theft Auto 4, who knows how many people you had on that. Well, it's about more than that. As the development teams get bigger, it, it's also because the audiences are getting bigger. And the bigger the audience, the more sales you're going to hit. You know, as, as movies became more widespread, their budget started skyrocketing. You know what I mean? So that's really more about the size of the audience. And the audience only gets bigger with DLC. I mean, look at it this way. If you hit an audience of X and you charge $60 selling it in a store, and you hit an audience of X6 because you charge $10 online, with an instant DLC download, you will make the same amount of money. But you'll hit six times the audience. I'm not saying companies should have some kind of magical, righteous altruism regarding the sales of their games, but you might as well expand your audience, because that way when your sequel comes up, your install base is already there. Anyway, that's just my thought. When I say $10, I don't mean like the games that are now $10. I mean like games that are now 60 and more should be 5 to 10 and games that are now 5 to 10 should be $1 to $2 max. And then DLC content for the games that are 10 should be $1 to $2 max each. I really mean this. And ultimately, this will happen in the next, not even, like 10 to 15 years. These prices are going to become pretty universal. We're still in that adjustment, which has been going on for 10 years. And it's going to take another 10 of going from physical to everything just being digital. And once that happens, prices go down. Just look at the App Store for the iPhone and the iPad. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's not even like a debate. It's going to fucking happen. It's just a matter of how long it's going to take, because a lot of these games are fucking expensive. And sponsors, if you're hearing this, hint, hit, nudge, nudge, this shit ain't free, you know? The Lich King one asks, my question is, do you do anything to prepare for recording, or do you just do it? I tried to record some video tutorials on 3D modeling, but I ended up recording and re-recording the first one of them over 20 times, because I would get stuck in a word and don't know how to finish up a sentence and start over. The reviews, I heavily script, you know, I definitely improv some of it, you know, I'm sure you can hear. But sure, I write a lot of it out, you know, because when I'm playing the game, I'll think of a joke, I'll write the joke down, and then before I go over it, I'll string it together into something more concise. Um, I couldn't really give you a percentage how much is not scripted. It varies from review to review. But uh, yeah, it's heavily scripted. To anyone who thinks I'm just saying all this in one take randomly off the top of my head, you know, get real. Anyone who's worked in any kind of production knows that no matter how good you think you are, you need, you know, you need multiple takes. This isn't a stage play, and even stage plays are, how you say, scripted. As far as getting stuck in a word and having to do it 20 times over, you know, sometimes you just gotta work through it. Also, you know what might help? You know, take one or two shots of whiskey, wait two minutes, and go. Doesn't hurt. M. Gluss asks, Okay, how do you feel about the new online business? How will this new brand of internet affect the old? Will there be games on this gizmo? Wii HD 2010 or 2011, what do you say? What are your thoughts on PlayStation Move? Are you more inclined towards Project Natal? Did you feel cheated when the Motion Plus attachment suddenly appeared? I mean, shouldn't the Wiimote be able to do that without extra expense? Wow. Okay, that one's pretty loaded. Starting with OnLive. Um, boy, I have a lot to say about OnLive. Most of you probably haven't even heard of it yet. It goes online pretty soon. Um, betas might actually already be up. 
somewhere. This is essentially Netflix, but instead of just streaming, you know, readable content, uh, you actually play games on it. You will have a controller, looks, I guess, like a 360 controller, and you will either do it through your computer or you have a little box where, you know, normally you'd put a console that you'd be playing on. It's a small box, I don't think it costs much, mainly connects the internet. You play the games that are really re regular games that come out on PC and consoles now, but you play them off a PC that's within a thousand mile radius. And there are a number of these locations all over the country, and there's like one little window in I think one of the Dakotas that doesn't get reception, so 62 people are shit out of luck for the time being. But other than that, you're streaming games off a server somewhere, they update their graphics card supposedly, they say every six months, so you constantly have top-of-the-line PC graphics streaming to wherever you are. And that, I mean, I saw someone play this on a fucking iPhone. It is real. I saw someone play Crisis in high qualities on a fucking iPhone, if you can believe that. It was, re I mean, it's iPhone controls, but it means it works. As magical as this sound, it fucking works. All right, I, I don't think it's 1080 yet. It might just be 720, unless you have something like Fios, which, you know, in a year or two will be much more widespread than it is now. To anyone who wants to skip what I have to say, uh... I pretty much agree with Michael Pachter. Uh, he said everything I'd been thinking about a week ago in his latest pack attack on uh, game trailers. And he's right. This is the thing that's going to, you know, knock out the console generation, next uh, generation. I mean, frankly, before on live, I was pretty convinced that the next console generation would be the last for a number of reasons, just the way that tech curve is going. Um, and this, you know, this current console generation is going to be one of the longest as well since like the, you know, original Atari days for a number of reasons that I don't need to get into right now. But, uh, yeah, on live, uh, we'll have a built user base in about two or so years when the new consoles come out, two, two and a half years. I also think on live is going to be one of those things that pushes prices down. Uh, publishers love it because GameStop, when they buy a used game and resell it, they get all that money and the publishers get fucked. And it's kind of hard to sell back to GameStop, like your DLC shit. And GameStop, you know, that whole thing kind of rips you off anyways. The whole EB trade in your old games thing is kind of dying. And publishers love that. They love that, and I can't blame them. Also, they get a bigger cut with stuff like OnLive than compared to, you know, just selling the license. But I'm not going to get into that right now, because that's not what this question is about. But of the two things that I think will change the industry over the next five years, it's OnLive and Limitless Data, which ditches polygons. Um, and this is one of those things. Somebody asked me a question about Limitless Data, I'll get to it, or you can just Google it. It's very beta now, but in the next 18 months to two years, you'll start to see it pop up. And as far as will there be new games on this gizmo, uh, there already are. I mean, the beta tests, which might have already started by now, had a bunch of licensed games that are out on 360, PS3, PC. So yeah. What are your thoughts on PlayStation Move, Project Natal, Wii Motion Plus? You know, I understand why people might feel gypped that they had to launch a Wii Motion Plus. And the sad thing is that they had some stuff that could be considered pretty one-to-one-ish in Wii Sports. But, you know, most third-party developers out there just do not have Nintendo's chops. Nintendo has the best development teams on the planet, even if their consoles aren't the strongest on the planet. So, I guess when they made the Wiimote, they just figured other people would be as good at programming as they were. Plus, it's their own hardware, and programming on your own hardware, you know, never hurts to streamline things. But look, other people didn't really have Nintendo's development balls, so they had to release training wheels which is essentially what Motion Plus is. Um, ultimately, it's a good thing, but it's sad other people couldn't, you know, carry their own weight when it came to development. As far as Project Natal and PlayStation Move goes, until you're hands-on with new stuff, it's hard to judge. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm not going to get too deep into that. I haven't touched them yet. Natal, you don't even touch. <laughs> so I reserve judgment. What looks most interesting to me, and people are going to say fanboyism, so, you know, whatever, is PlayStation Move. A lot of people are saying, well, you know, that's just what Nintendo's doing, plus what Microsoft is doing. Well, yeah, it's both, and that's awesome. Look, if one girl gives you a blowjob, and the other girl shows you her titties, and someone says, well, you can choose between the blowjob and the titties, and someone says, well, I'm going to be really unoriginal and do both, you know, sometimes being unoriginal is pretty sensible, I'm just saying. So, you know, I don't really care about originality here. Oh, yeah, Wii HD 2010 or 2011. Uh, you know, Pactor says they'll announce it maybe even at E3 and release it this fall. Uh, other than Borderlands, that guy usually is not wrong. So I think they'll at least, no matter what, they'll announce it this year, either at E3 or sometime this fall. Makes most more sense to announce it this year. So once it's announced, it'll either come out fall or spring next year. And, uh, yeah, that's what I think. Ed, out.